So welcome. This is a presentation on Git. Uh, if you're not familiar with Git, Git is a version control system. Uh, it is not a system for backups. I just want to start off with that right off the bat. Some people think that if you start using Git that you're backing things up and if you go in there and you delete that folder, that folder is gone. You have not backed anything up. And even if you're using something like GitHub, GitLab, anything like that, you still need to make sure that you use backups. I just want to put that out there before people start using Git and then you know get involved in that and then find out that it was not doing what they thought it was. Uh, no, no. Not personal experience on my end, but for other people that I have borne witness to this with. So uh, if you want to install Git, Git is available for almost every single operating system. Git is available through Windows using Chocolatey or by downloading Git. Git is available on Linux. You can use, catch this, apt git install git. Uh, brew, you can use brew install git anywhere that you want to go. Git will most likely be available to you. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so what is Git? Git is version control. So what is version control? Simply what you can do when you use Git is be able to see the difference between a file that you were working on and what that file looks like two weeks later, an hour later, as long as you have done some sort of change after committing that file into Git itself. Uh, you can see differences and you can also roll back those differences and that doesn't sound like extremely fascinating or oh wow you know I can do the same thing I have an undo button on my keyboard I can you know Apple Z and then go back in time you can go back in time after making multiple changes you can go back in time after you know working on this project moving over to another project coming back later and you can also make changes in other people's projects, present it to them, and then they can use it as a system in order to be able to verify your changes against what they were doing previously. So you can see uh, a lot of different things. And we're going to demonstrate this here in a moment. So what can you use Git for? Well, generally text files. Uh, if you are making changes in text, and I say text, not necessarily programming, but if you're making changes in text, you can use Git in order to follow your revisions as you work on those files. Uh, if you are a coder, you can use Git. If you are a student who is in school and you are working on a school paper, and maybe you're working with a group or a team, you can use Git. Uh, Git will allow you to follow changes, but in addition to that, you can use Git to track who is contributing. Uh, there are also tools and plugins for that as well, but uh, Git on a whole is excellent for anybody who's working with text files. Now, Hans mentioned earlier, uh, if you're dealing with images or let's say that you're dealing with a vagrant file and you have a vagrant box that you have inside of your folder that you're dealing with, you're going to want to use a file called a git ignore file, which we'll go over here shortly. But uh, binary files, not very good with Git. You don't really want to put images or anything, uh, video, stuff like that into the system. Uh, mostly, you're going to want to use this for text. So how do we use it? Well, as you can see here, we're going to go ahead and start right here. So what I have here is a folder called temp. And I've made some files inside of that folder. We have a readme file that has some text in it. So I'm letting everybody know, hey, we're learning Git. Hey, everybody, this is a practice repository. But it's not a repository yet, but it will be here in a second. In addition to that, we have our story about Captain Crank. This is a file. We've already added some text to it. And then you can also see I have an ID RSA file and a pub file in here. Maybe I need to track those because I'm going to be using those keys right there in order to uh, upload files to, I don't know, let's say Amazon uh, or to our GitHub account. Now, of course, we're not going to want to push those two files up there to the public. We don't want somebody to have our ID RSA keys. We don't want anybody to really even have that pub key if we can help it. We want to control who has that. Uh, 
So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to make a file called the git ignore file. And we're going to open it. And it's completely empty right now. And this file is extremely powerful. This git ignore file is your way of monitoring what is going to be under version control. We had some, R some ID RSA files. So we can actually mark those. And all we have to do is say anything that has ID underscore RSA, even if it's the pub file, now that that's in there, those files will no longer be under version control. So we have this folder, and we want to make it under version control. So we type git in it, hit enter, and we have now initialized an empty git repository. And as you can see, my, uh, my bash has updated to show that we are on master. Uh, you may not see this. This is something that I have added to my bash inside of my dot files, which we will go over here shortly. However, uh, this is a very, very good way of being able to track exactly what uh, branch you were on. What a branch is, you have master, which means these are your main files. From there, it's much like a tree. So you have your trunk, which is your, your main files, and then you have branches, which is essentially where you can take those files, you can switch to a new branch, you can work on them, you can commit that branch, and then you can have a completely separate working environment for those files separate from your main branch. So if you wanted to, you could work on your story or on your coding project or whatever it is that you're working on, decide, you know what, I need to branch this project off for somebody else and I'm going to go ahead and add some comments for a very specific programmer or whatever. You can make a new branch and again, this is just a, a discussion before we start getting more hands on on this. You can then create a new branch, send that branch off for somebody else to work on. They can commit to that branch, send it back to you, and then you can diff the files so that you can still bring all of that new code into your project. And it allows you to have, I mean, I, the way I want to put this is this is like the most amazing thing that I've ever worked with as far as being a computer programmer. Being able to work on a project, branch, send off whatever it is that I'm working on to another computer programmer, have him working on it concurrently with me, and then being able to send those changes back, and us essentially being able to work on the same file at the same time, and very quickly uh, diff those files and get those changes integrated so that we can get a working project up and running is fantastic. If you've ever had to work on a, a file while waiting for another person who wanted to work on that file, this is a, a, an absolute godsend as far as being able to work concurrently on a project. Uh, and when we get to how people are using GitHub, we'll discuss that as well. So I'm going to type a command called git status. And if you see here, git status says git sees that we have a git ignore file, git sees that we have a readme file, and then we have our story file. So that's telling you what git sees. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to remove those files that we had put in the git ignore file, git status again, and you see they come back. This is letting you know git now sees these files. So that git ignore file, that's your control right there for what is going to go out and what is not going to go out. And if you want to hear some horror stories, Google, I uploaded my ID RSA key to GitHub. If you would like to read stories about people who have received $20,000 bills from Amazon, that's, that's where you want to go. That, that is, uh, you know, bust out the marshmallows, sit around the campfire, and talk about horror stories from Amazon EC2. So we're going to go back into Git Ignore, and we're going to block all of our ID RSA keys again. And that point right there that I made will save you tons of headaches. Trust me. So now, what we want to do is we want to tell Git that we want to add these three files to version control. So we're going to do git add in order to let it know that we want to add this, and then the period key. 
And what that does is it takes all three of these files and it adds it to uh, staging. So git status. And you'll now see that all of them are green. And it tells you that these are all changes ready to be committed. And what we're telling Git is these are the files that we want to add to the project so that we can start monitoring any changes to them within the project itself. So I'm going to do a git commit. And we can use switch m. And we can say this is our initial commit. And this is just going to let Git know, hey, we're adding these three files. And this is the message that I want tagged to this initial commit. This is just to let people know we have created a repository. And that's very important, having that text there. And I will show you here in a moment that you can actually open up an entire Vim editor and work inside of that as well, just for your commit messages. Uh, the reason why this is important is because when you start using tools like GitHub or GitLab, those commit messages that you leave in here are going to be the the breadcrumb that other programmers are going to use to follow exactly what you did. So if you go in there and you edit a file, they can, of course, sit down and do git diff. But you might want to explain to them why you changed uh, you know, maybe the first letter on somebody's name from a lowercase letter to an uppercase letter. Hey, I did this because uh, that's the rule in grammar that we need to follow, slash uh, you know, spelling, period, whatever. And then you can let them know, even you know, reference book number whatever from my college textbook. So what we've done is we have created tracking for these three files. And we're still on master. So we're still on the master branch right now. So now, as you can see, when we do git status, there are no files inside of that list. Because git has checked those files and seen that there are no changes right now. It doesn't see any differences as far as the files are concerned. So let's change that. So I'm going to go into Vim readme. And I'm going to add a new header. And this is just markdown. So if you're familiar with markdown, all it is is you know add a hash mark. Hello world. This is going to be our second commit. OK? So we've edited that file. Git status. Now it lets you know that file has been modified. And of course, this is a very small example. So when you're working with something like this, you might be looking at it and thinking, well, of course, I know that file's modified. Uh, you know, I just modified it, obviously. However, think about the fact that when you've been working on a project for days, you've been changing multiple files. Uh, maybe you've been working on different aspects of the system, and then you go home for the weekend and you come back. This is a good way of knowing exactly what's been modified. And of course, we're not going to want to leave it like this. We want to be able to commit these things so that we can go back and get diff between each different commit. So we're going to do git add, period, again. Or if you wanted to, you could do git add and then the name of the file. Because we can individually do commits. You can add them to staging on an individual file basis. So if you are working on something and you edited one file and then you realize you only want to check in that file, you can do so. Period is just a, a very easy, fast method to add all of the files. So git add. And now I'm going to do a git commit. However, what I'm not going to do is add switch m. So now it opens this up and we're in Vim. So we can go in here and say, I am teaching, actually, let's do this so I can show you something. Additions. I am teaching a course. This is some additional information that folks may be interested in. So what I've done here is when you're starting to use different Git tools like uh, GitHub, GitLab, uh, and there are others, you can actually format your commit in a specific way in order for that information to be parsed. So like if you have GitLab and you put in that you have an error 
or an issue, maybe a bug report, you can actually go in and put open parentheses, fix, close parentheses, colon, the number for that bug issue, uh, let's say it's 137 or something, space, and then a very quick blurb, which will be the, the you know, I have fixed this error, and then you can move in to a next line, and then fill that out and continue, and then whenever you commit this, it will actually automatically close your uh, bug whenever somebody goes in and moves from staging to dev or from dev to, to master, or however it is that you do your version control as far as uh, making sure that the information is pushed up correctly and cleanly you know, until it goes live. You can have the system automatically close bugs for you. Uh, you can automatically open issues. You can do tons of things as long as you're using one of those tools and writing your commits correctly. So I'm going to close this. And we have one file change with three insertions. So if we do a git diff, we don't really see any changes, right? Because we're still working on master. So git checkout, we're going to make a new branch, dash b, lowercase. And we're going to say chapter 1. So as you can see on my bash prompt, we've now switched over to chapter one, and that means that we are now in a new branch. So whatever I'm editing here currently will not affect master. So I can go in and let's add some text here. This is a file. This is another line. Git status. So we have modified that file. Git add, git commit dash m. I have updated my story there. Oh, sorry. So now what I've done is git diff. Over here on the right hand side, I told it bring up master. On the left hand side, I told it to take the current branch that I'm in and I have brought them up for a comparison. As you can see on master, that second line does not exist. As you can see under uh, our current chapter one, we have a second line. So again, these are all very, very basic, simple examples just to demonstrate some of the things that you can do. Now this right here is Vim diff. Uh, there are different diffing tools that you can use. Uh, I know for a fact Adam has its own method of doing diffs. Uh, Emacs does as well. Uh, of course, Vim. So generally, if you have some sort of text editor available to you, you're going to be able to use something very similar to this or this method here. So I'm going to close that. And then, yes. Can you get metadata from Vim diff, like commit time, add time? You can add those. I don't have that currently because at work, this is actually my work computer, so I'll just go over some of the stuff that we do. We have GitLab, and so essentially it's me and another guy who are doing the programming. I don't need all that additional information, and anytime that we make any changes, we, you know, almost hourly, we push it up to, to GitLab. We're constantly pulling, you know, fetch, pull, and monitoring changes that way. So, yes, there are ways to be able to get all of that data presented to you. However, my system's not set up for that. So, oh, I lost my mouse. There it is. Okay. So, next thing I want to show you all is an example of how I'm using this just to give you a better idea of some of the other things you can do. Just in case you're not a writer and you're not a programmer, that's okay. If you're a computer user, there's still things that you can do. So what we have here are my dot files. And within this folder, I have all of my bash functions, my bash profile, bash prompt, uh, all of my work aliases. I have an extras folder which contains all of my work uh, SSH keys, et cetera, et cetera. I have a git ignore that is chock full of stuff. I have all of my tmux configura configuration files. Uh, I have 
essentially every script that I use, including my new and improved VimRC. If you uh, watch my previous class, I've added a whole ton of stuff here. Uh, I have placed all of that under version control. In addition to that, I have moved all of that up to GitHub. Uh, I span up a fresh copy of Ubuntu approximately two days ago. And as far as my configurations go and getting everything set up for configurations, it literally took me a few seconds. I get cloned my dot files, and then I symlinked all of the dot files to my home directory, and then I was up and running. Uh, the, the abilities that you have using version control, again, don't just think of it as coding or just as, you know, if it's text, you can use version control on it. I don't want anybody to think that you can't really use it for, you know, your project. If you really sit down and think about how you could use something like this, there's probably a use case for whatever it is that you're doing. If you have binaries, virtual images, or um, uh, web server web services that are large blobs. There's a tool called Git Annex that um, handles versioning of those by inserting a layer of pointers. But it, it'll take a lot of the volume out of uh, working with blobs. Okay. Essentially, I and when we get to it, I'm going to also demonstrate Jekyll pages. So, sort of a free gift to everybody. If you don't have a web page, by the time you're done with this course tonight and viewing what we're doing here, uh, you can have a free web page uh, up and running within a few minutes. Just FYI. So, stick around to the end. <laughs> uh, so, let's go over Git Ignore. Uh, Essentially, what I do with my git ignore file for all of my dot files is I go through and any of the programs that add folders, uh, you know, Newsbuter, Vim, all of those, all of those add folders. I don't want to version control that stuff because, like with Vim, I'm using Vundler. Vundler goes to Git, pulls things down for me. I don't need to version control what's already under version control. Uh, that's the other thing. You want to make sure that you're eliminating any kind of waste or any kind of uh, duplication. You really don't want to duplicate work. You don't want, if somebody has already pushed something to GitHub, you can use these tools in order to simplify your life by just pulling down what they already have. Unless, of course, you're making changes for personal use or whatever like that. And you can clone, you can, uh, you can spin up your own branch. There's a whole bunch of ton of ton of different things that you can do, but just for low level, if it's already up on GitHub, there's a good chance that you should already be able to use that, and you can simply block your Git from copying what's in their Git. And then, of course, my extras, like I said, ID, keys, uh, any kind of SSH stuff, anything that you want to keep private, you don't want to push up to your, your GitHub or anything like that. I can't stress that enough. Uh, too many horror stories online about you know multi-thousand dollar bills from people who have accidentally pushed these things online and some Bitcoin miner immediately went in there and they troll GitHub uh, by the minute. So literally you can push an ID key up and they will have Bitcoin mining gear span up on your server within minutes. Just so you guys know. That's it. Correct. All of the numbering there, that's all just Vim, anything that's on the left-hand side. And I use that just for line numbering, just for, right, the guy behind me says, hey, go to line 437 real quick. I can do it, and I know I'm there. Exactly. Nobody wants to have to sit there and count to line 437. So those are all of my dot files. And when we get to it, I'll show you. Uh, under my GitHub account, I have all of my dot files up. And there's tons of people who actually do this. So if you use a different editor or you are interested in sort of exploring what people are doing with Bash and with you know all their different tools that they have available to them. Most of the config files that you see under my account are available with completely different changes made under somebody else's account. Uh, something I like to do on the weekends is just sit around and troll through GitHub just to see what people are doing. And you know I have a I have an RSS feed reader which captures the feeds from every single one of the person that I'm watching 
and it lets me know whenever they push up changes to their Git repositories. So I know to go in and monitor and, and take a look at, you know, if somebody updated their Git files and they did something in VimRC, then I know I can go in there and take a look at that and see if that's something that I want to bring into my workflow. So if you're ever bored, GitHub's a great place to, fl to, to play because there's tons of things that you can go in there and explore. YouTube also has a good set of presentations on Profiles and MRC and things like that. Definitely. And YouTube, of course, yes. YouTube is a fantastic resource if you just want to sit around and watch videos all day uh, about computers. Literally get no work done. Or sleep. Right. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to create a new repository. And we're going to call it Turbo Octo Learning Cat. And we're going to say this is for learning because I'm going to delete this whenever I get a chance. Now, if you are on GitHub and you have a GitHub account, it's very, very simple to create a new repository. And you can also create a repository while adding a git ignore, which is a pre filled out git ignore for you so that you can kind of use that as an example. But I don't really recommend using GitHub's pre-filled out gitignore. Go to an established uh, package. Uh, WordPress is on here. A whole bunch of other folks are on here. Take a look at their git ignore files just to get an idea for what they're blocking. Because you can use that information to kind of decide, hey, what do I really need to put under version control? And then, of course, you can add a license if you would like to. Since this is just a public one and I'm going to delete it later, we're going to not initialize it with anything. So we're going to create the repository. And while that works, I'm going to go back to ours. OK. So we're on branch chapter one right now. We don't want to push up just this branch. We want to push up master, but we want to keep our changes. So. We're going to do git status, and we see that there's nothing to commit right now, so that means that this is completely up to date with what we wanted. We're going to git checkout master, and we're going to switch to branch master. At that point, oh, actually what we want to do, and you can see this is a, a clean working directory. Will it allow you to um, check out a new branch if you've got stuff that's open and uncommitted, or does it want you to? I'm going to show that next, that? but uh, that's a good question. I, we can just jump to that right now. So. Well, if you've got a schedule going on. No, it's it's cool. I, I it's good that we're. I'm glad that you asked because it means that people are wondering that. So let's make. <laughs> let's make a change to README, okay? So we're going to go here, and we're on master right now. And we're going to say one more. And we're just adding a new headline to README. That's all. So we do get status, right? And then we remember, you know what? I want to go back to chapter one because I want to make a change there. So we go git checkout chapter one, which is our branch. And we try to, and it lets us because of the fact that that file is modified, but it's not staged. So git. Check out master, git add readme, git checkout chapter one. And it let us through again. Let me add, actually, let me add it to the, the, uh, just a second. Git checkout master, git status. Get modified. Hmm. Okay. Um, I. That's okay. It's more flexible than thought. Yeah. It. It. I think I will need to have the remote branch added on there first, and then oh, we'll go back to it. Local branches. It keeps things in memory, but with a remote branch. Right. It insists on. Correct. So let me uh, let's roll back here. 
That's why this was in advance because you haven't found remote branches yet. Right. So we've created a branch, right? Let me just check this in. Git commit dash m added. Okay, so git status. Git uh, branch dash list. Oh, okay, so those are our two branches. Everything's checked in right now. Nothing to commit. And what we're doing here is we're doing a git remote add origin and then we're using the URL for what we just created on GitHub. So now that we've done that, if you go here and you refresh, nothing should change. So we're still on our page that lets us know, hey, there's nothing in here. But we want to change that. So we're going to do git push, and you can see on the page, all of the instructions are given to you. So if you decide you want to go play with this and you you know, want to work with the commands and things like that, essentially they walk you through every single step of the way. So you don't have to worry about you know, getting lost or anything like that. So what we're doing here is we're doing a push. And what push says is that we're going to take everything inside of whatever branch that we're currently in, and we're going to take that and we're going to move it to the origin, which is that URL right there. And what we're saying is we want to move master. So we hit it, and it's moved it up. Now, if you notice, it didn't ask me any questions about a username. It didn't ask me any questions about a password or anything like that. You have two options when it comes to, uh, well, essentially, you have three. So you have three options when dealing with something like GitHub or GitLab or any kind of remote repository. Your first option is to constantly type in a username and password, which is super annoying, takes a lot of time, and isn't fun for anybody. Your second option is to set yourself up with an SSH key, so ID RSA. Uh, if you create an SSH key and you link that to your account, which I'm not going to go to because it puts all kinds of information up on the screen and I don't want that going up, but uh, you can have an SSH key added. The, the last option, and I'm going to just pull it up, is a file called a, let's see, where is it? Well, I've lost it, and I don't want to slow down. You can also add a file that will keep your username and password uh, for HTTPS login over the command line, which is what I'm using here, because occasionally uh, SSH is blocked. You might be on a network that is hostile to SSH. If that's the case and you cannot access SSH, you can do it through HTTPS, and there is a file that you can create, which the instructions are actually on, lo and behold, the GitHub web page on how to do so, and that's the file that I'm currently using. And essentially, all it does is it keeps your username, it keeps your password, and it tells it what account that you're trying to connect to. So if you have multiple GitHub accounts, which GitHub kind of frowns upon, but you can do so. If you do have multiple GitHub accounts, uh, you can very easily and very quickly uh, use that information to constantly push information up to GitHub without having to type in your username and password. So regardless of what kind of network you're connecting to, there's probably a way for you to be able to do it. So now that we've done that, I'm going to refresh the page. And now we see our stuff up here. So, and I know I mentioned that there is a way to have a web page through GitHub. This is not it. Don't worry. It's not just a text file. There's something better. But here we can see our repository. So we created a repository called Turbo Octo Learning Cat. We have a master branch because that's the only branch that we pushed up so far. Our readme file is placed here. And it's all marked down. So if you can create headings, uh, you know, header one, header two, header three, as long as you can use markdown, you can do so here. And then we have all of our files in here. This is a file. Uh, 
Some of the tools that you can use here are you can create issues, uh, you can create pull requests if you are working with somebody else or they don't know that you're working with them. You can go in, you can pull their code, you can make changes, edits, improve it, make it worse, do whatever it is that you want, and then you can push it back up to the server, open up a pull request and ask them, hey, I wanna merge this to whatever it is that you're working on. They can review it, review it and all of this is extremely simplified. It, you know, they can look at the code side by side, see what you did, see exactly what you did. Uh, it's very difficult to hide changes as long as somebody's paying attention, so you don't have to worry about you know, somebody trying to sneak something into the project or anything like that. Uh, GitHub will highlight, essentially, every change that's made, so you can look and make sure that somebody's not trying to do something negative with your code. Uh, and then you can make a decision to either merge it in, add it to another branch, or simply say, hey, I don't want this, and toss it to the side. And uh, something to keep in mind, and I don't know if you all have noticed, you probably have seen, I put a lot of my writings on here, I create latex resumes, things like that, I make files for folks so that they have templates, stuff like that. Uh, I've had people do pull requests to try to be funny and add negative text, bad things in there, you know, bad words, so on and so forth. Uh, all of that stuff sticks and it stays. So I just want to make it clear that whatever you're doing on here, once you use an account to do something silly, that you know it creates a footprint that GitHub essentially keeps forever. Um, full, audit. full audit trail. Exactly, full audit trail. That so something to keep in mind. Uh, you know, if you're decide to pull somebody's stuff because you think it's funny or anything like that, just keep in mind that it shows up on your account. Uh, you can also create wikis. Uh, GitHub supports allowing you to create a wiki. Again, this is not the web page that I was talking about. Uh, GitHub sort of has a, a gamified system of keeping track of you know, how many days you've logged in, how many times you've added things. Uh, you can use it if, it if it keeps you motivated. You know, Every day you want to make a new change to improve your VimRC or something. Uh, you can keep track of all of that stuff as well through uh, GitHub. So let's go back here, and we're going to go back into our stuff, and now I think we should be able to do what we were talking about a moment ago. So git status, so git merge chapter 1. So what I did was a command called git merge. And if you remember just a minute ago, we were in chapter one and we added a little bit of text. What I'm telling it now is I wanna take everything that we did, every single change that we made inside of chapter one, and we're gonna merge it into master. And maybe somebody just made those changes for you, or again, you were working with somebody and they sat down at the computer, made some changes, you've decided that you really, really like them and you wanna keep them and we're gonna push them up to the server because we wanna share this with the whole world. We can go in there and we can say, okay, we're gonna merge. In addition to that, I want to say, hey, I added this because it is super awesome. And we close. And now it lets you know, hey, this is the file, Captain Kirk. We made one change with one insertion. So it just gives you an idea of whenever we made these changes, this is exactly what was done. And all of this is about being able to, to audit what you're doing with your text file, with your code, with whatever it is that you're doing. Anything that you're working on, you should be able to go back and see what kind of changes that we made. So we do git status, and now it's giving us a new mes message when we do git status. It's saying that we are ahead of origin master by two commits. And we want to use git push which was the command that we used earlier, in order to push these changes that we have up to the server. It's letting you know that the server is behind you. Whatever is local to your machine, that will be lost if you lose the machine. Uh, again, do not ever use Git, GitHub, GitLab, anything like that as a backup server. Really don't, because if it's important enough for you to write it down, it should be important enough for you to keep it in multiple places. Uh, you know, is it likely that GitHub is going to disappear tomorrow? No, it's not. 
but just in case, always make sure that you keep backups of whatever it is that you're working on in a second place. Uh, can't stress that enough. Yeah, I mean, uh, Google Code, FreshMeet, these things don't last forever. Correct. Well, an example of, of something like this is Vitorious, which was a competitor to GitHub. Um, yeah. Got acquired or merged with another group and then basically had a bunch of their repos disappear with very little notice. So, you know, if, think about if you need more notice than the time you were on vacation, then you want to make sure you have recent copies. Definitely. So, huh. this is funny, I can't get it to, to stop me. Uh, yeah. Um, so you need a separate branch that has changes that aren't in your current, or you need a separate branch. So the way you can do it is in one branch, edit your story to have some extra sentence, and then in your current branch, edit, or in a different branch, edit it, but don't commit it, and then try and check out the other branch because the commits will overwrite it. There we go. Thank you. Check out. But in anything less than complete confusion like this, it pretty much handles things automatically. It really does. Yeah. Work. See, so I, try changing the same line so it can't just sure. merge the diffs. Which branch? Dogs. Oh, discovered an interview question. Yep. <laughs> Can you break Red it? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know it says hi everyone to sure. or hey everyone to something sure. else. Okay, get check out master. Okay, well, sorry. I I guess I'm not good enough to break yet right now. Uh, it, it's been a long time since I've had any kind of uh, commit collisions. So anyways, what we're trying to do here is I'm trying to demonstrate that uh, if you are working on something and you perform an action which is going to leave the system confused as to what you want to actually accomplish, uh, the system will actually warn you, hey, you've made a change here, you've made a change here, these two changes, we think they co collide, they make no sense, it will give you a warning and then essentially ask you to either take those changes and discard them, which you can do so by stashing them. Uh, Git stash allows you to take the changes that you made and simply set them aside for later so you can bring them back if you need them. Uh, it's like a temporary holding cell for changes. And then in addition to that, uh, when you do git diff, you can actually go in there and it will show you the changes, show you where that collision is occurring, and then tell you, okay, go ahead and fix it right now. So you can use Vim or your favorite editor, depending on whatever it is that you're using, in order to make the changes to fix that collision so that that is no longer a problem, and then you can push your files up and no longer have an issue. Um, I guess somewhere in my brain I can't remember how to break git, so sorry. Uh, it's been a long time since I've done it. If you do get clones, you'll probably see it at some point with um, changes to the git ignore, because your local git ignore file will probably be different than the git ignore of the project. Yes, definitely. Uh, you can have issues with that too. So the last thing I want to go over is something called Jekyll. And what Jekyll is, is a web hosting method uh, that you can use, which is supported by GitHub. And GitHub has a program called GitHub Pages. I'm going to go to that right now. And it's pages.github.com. And if you have a GitHub account, which a GitHub account is free, 
uh, then you have access to a tool called GitHub Pages. And you can actually create a web page using GitHub Pages. And the whole web page is really designed out of just working with text files. So it's super friendly to Git and GitHub itself. Uh, I will show you my repository. This is exactly what it will look, actually look like as far as the repository goes. There are themes out there. You can look for Jekyll themes. I'm actually crea currently creating my own theme. Uh, it's just based off of Solarized, and I'll show you here the page here shortly. Uh, I use Font Awesome, Solarized, and Bootstrap in order to create a Jekyll theme, which is super basic, super easy, but that's the whole point of doing it this way. And all you really have to do since it is blog aware, is create posts in Markdown. So here's one. And all you have to do is sit down and make some text and push it up to GitHub, and it will actually become a post. Very similar if you're familiar with WordPress or any kind of other blogging software, uh, you can do the same thing here. And you get a small URL. Uh, it's your username. Uh, it's your username .github.io, and I can just show it to you. I mean, like I said, it's nothing. It's just solarized, bootstrap, font awesome for some of the icons down here at the bottom, and a couple of handful of posts. And you can do other pages. I mean, anything you can do with a web page, this is what it is. It's, it's a web page. Uh, and again, it's free. It comes with every single GitHub account. You can spin one up within seconds. They have uh, a tool called Octopress. And if you were to download Octopress, it gives you a set of commands uh, that allow you to very quickly initialize one of these sites so you can get a frame theme, uh, a theme framework. Uh, it creates all the, the folders that you need, things like that. And then you can go in there and just edit and play. And then whenever you're ready, Git push it up to your repository, and it's immediately published. And again, that's totally free. Uh, Essentially, anybody who doesn't have a web page can now have a web page as long as they have a GitHub account. This is some of the information about it. Uh, they, they really go step by step on everything that you need. You can create a repository. They will even ask you what client you're using. So if you're on Mac, Windows, if you're just using a terminal, even if you don't know, uh, they'll try to sort of guide you. I said, I don't know. It tried to give me one for Mac tells you what to clone, uh, how to create files, exactly how to push everything that we went over here just a few minutes ago, and then where you can go in your browser in order to see your new web page. Uh, if you want to be able to work with images, again, we talked about how GitHub's really not the place to put binary files up. You don't want to put images, things like that up. Uh, what you can do is you can mix tools like GitHub with tools like Imgur. Uh, for all of my Imgur images, I push all of my images up to Imgur, and then I link from Imgur inside of the web page and load all of the images off of a, a remote server. Uh, tons of different ways in order to solve whatever problems you might be running into. Lots of themes, lots of different examples, and essentially, since it is GitHub, again, go up here, search, look inside of there, and you can find a million and one different uh, GitHub sites if you need a little bit of inspiration or anything like that. Loads of people have them. You can use them for projects, teams, uh, you know, single user, anything of the sorts. Uh, other than that, that about covers it. That's sort of a, a rough introduction to Git. Um, like I said, there's there's even more stuff that you can do. There's working with teams. Uh, for a while, I was pulling every single Git repository that I had down into Dropbox, and then being able to work on those projects as long as I had Dropbox on the computer, even if I didn't have access to Git. I could go in there, make changes, edit, get to another computer that actually had Git, and then sit down and diff all of my changes and, and work on them that way. Uh, that's not as good, because if you're multi-platform, which is what the problem I was dealing with, Windows. Uh, essentially edits every single file by adding hidden characters. So you end up with tons of uh, changes, even if the file wasn't changed. And there's ways to, to, yeah. to solve that. Those are just line ending. Correct. 
you can even tell Git to ignore them. On OSX, you'll get the .ds store stuff. And all of those you can add to Git ignore, which, again, as you're working on the files and you sort of get more and more familiar with it, you'll find that your Git ignore file sort of becomes like a go-to Git ignore file. Uh, it's one that you'll copy from, pro, from, from uh, you know, project to project because essentially you know that, like he said, if you're on a Mac, DS store is going to show up, icon, question mark is going to show up, any of those things can, can find their way into your project and then you need to, to handle those. So lots and lots of fun tools, lots of interesting things. In addition to that, you can use it for making free web pages. So that might be just enough push to get people interested in just giving it a try. One last thing on get ignore. You have to ignore something before you add it. If you add it, it's in the project. You can't ignore it afterwards. Correct. You can pull it out, but it's a super pain to can't do it. Can't you just do git delete? No, because, well, if it's still in staging, you can. So if you've added a file and it's still in staging, you can git reset and then git delete and, and update your, uh, you can update your git ignore. But if you've already pushed it to a remote repository and you don't want to destroy the repository because you're going to lose all of your changes, uh, there are very specific steps you can take in order to uh, destroy the head, remove the very last commit that was made, move back. I mean, there's a ton of stuff that you can do that's, uh, you have to redo all the commits after that, right? Well, there's ways of handling it within Git, but that's sort of more advanced. And in addition to that, uh, every time I've accidentally pushed something or moved it towards that, I've just destroyed the repository and started over. So it was just faster to do it that way for me instead of having to s search through Stack Overflow uh, to try to find the correct command. So. And this happens in all kind of reports. Sub uh, Subversion has the same kind of. If you committed something you didn't want to commit, it's painful. Exactly. We used SVN before uh, before Git when I was at my previous job, and it was the same way. You put something into SVN or you know hit the wrong key or sneezed at it funny or anything like that. We had. Hey, it's not that bad. It was pretty bad. I like Git a lot better. Yes. Our question, I noticed that your prompt is actually showing you which branch you're on and Correct. other things. What is so that's in my dot files, that's actually a, a function that I lifted off of another programmer uh, who was kind enough to put that up into his repository. Uh, I will show it to you. Yes, I will show. So I have a ton of stuff going on inside of my, my bash prompt here. I'm actually using something called tmux. And then in addition to that, down at the bottom, uh, it, that's sort of power line, uh, and it gives you information about how much RAM I'm using, what's going on with the processor, all kinds of stuff down there. So dot bash. Oh, this mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Is it in here? No, it's not. Where did yeah, I put it? I didn't it? recognize the left-hand prompts. Let's see. Uh, sorry. Trying to figure out where I put it. So I have everything. I think it's under bash functions. Yes. OK. So it's called prompt git, uh, prompt underscore git. And essentially, it just goes in, figures out what branch I'm on, figures out if there's been any changes. I don't know if you noticed, but the icon changed from uh, dollar symbol to exclamation point to different items to let me know whether or not there was something in that hasn't been checked in, You know what branch you're on, all of that. It, and all of that is super important because you don't want to check out a branch, work on it for 45 minutes, and then realize you should have been in another branch. Uh, that I run into often, uh, super not fun, because then you're having to go back after you already pushed it up to GitLab and take your branch off of GitLab, go back, make changes or stash or whatever it is that you got to do, and then uh, move back to your branch and move those things around. There's a lot of juggling that can happen, especially when you're working on a very large project. But tools like this are really, really helpful as far as. Uh, you just found that online someplace? Or? Uh, so. The guy that I work with is super into uh, 
putting all of his dot files and stuff like that online. So he pulled it off of somebody, and then I went in, and while I was looking through his dot files, I pulled it off of him. So essentially, GitHub uh, and just exploring. So. What was that again? Uh, git underscore prompt. Yes, git under or prompt underscore git. And then since under GitHub you work with Markdown a lot, you spend a lot of time dealing with Markdown. I created a function called check Markdown, and this is mine. You'll only find it in my thing. And I use a tool called Pandoc uh, in order to turn Markdown into HTML, and then I pipe that into eLinks and force HTML. So while I'm working on a Markdown file, I can sit there and very quickly push it into essentially a browser so I can look at what it's going to look like when it ends up on their site without ever having to load it in anything. Spend a lot of time in terminal and I can actually, I can kind of demo this real quick. Just uh, What is your GitHub account name? I write things. And essentially, you will find my LaTeX files for like resumes, stuff like that. I try to, to, my way of giving back to the community is I sit down and I make templates for people. So like if you're trying to make a, a resume, you can programmatically make your resume and then use uh, LaTeX to PDF in order to create a PDF file. And then if you ever need to go back and update your resume, you can do it very quickly. Uh, I also write a bunch of stories. So yeah, I'm a 250-pound neckbeard who writes fan fiction. So that's on there too. And then in addition to that, I have all my dot files. And as you can see, like that's my readme file. And I have converted it from Markdown into HTML and then pushed it up to eLinks just so I can view it. And you can see, you know, like URLs is sort of pushed off to the side. That's supposed to be a header. It's not perfect, but it gives me a, a rough idea of what it's going to look like when it's in there. How does eLinks display tables? Uh, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's. It's not perfect, but. Uh, you know, I just I don't have anybody to print it and read it to me, so that's which would be better. Nobody that Richard Stallman joke. Oof. Okay, never mind. Richard Stallman uses eLinks. He has somebody print web pages for him, and then he reads them off of, OK. Never mind. <laughs> I'll be here all night, guys. <laughs> and the reason he does that, and he's traveling an awful lot, particularly to places that have no or very poor connectivity. That's why he does it. Oh, I believe I, I think I figured out how to get Git to give you an error about committing. OK. So what you need is in. Do you want to go to your repo? Yep, let's so do it. Make sure this works first. Let's just make sure, or in master, make sure you have everything committed. You got it. All right, I don't. So I'm going to git add everything, and then I'm going to git commit dash m done. This is exciting. We're actually actively trying to break something. So this is let's do this. So now create a new yes, create a new branch. Okay. So I'm going to do git branch, or I'm sorry, git checkout. Dash B, and I'm going to do, what do you want to call it? Broken. Broken. Let's do it. All right, so now we're on branch broken. So now go back, or now, yes, go edit broken and okay. edit the readme and change change the first line. Uh huh. And then we want to commit this. Okay. And now, yeah, commit this. Okay. So I'm going to commit it as breaking it. So now we want to check out master. And now edit the first line of the readme, but something different. You got it. And yep. now try checking out the branch we created. Broken. Yes, it worked. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, we finally we broke it. OK. so. <laughs> uh, your local changes to the following files would be overwritten by checkout. If we moved to broken from where we are right now in master, 
that would tell us that whatever changes we just made in master would go away. We would lose those. They're not staged. They're not commit, committed. They're not being pushed to anything, anything like that. So we would essentially not be able to do this. It's telling you no. This only will happen if you've edited the same thing that may, has conflicting diff. Correct. So if we're, if we're going to end up with conflicts, this is your warning. Most of the time, this shouldn't happen. Right. So there's a tool called git stash, which you can run. So we're going to do git stash. And what it has done is it has taken all of the changes that we have right now inside of master and place those off to the side. So we still have those changes, but they've just been moved. So what it's warning you to do is to go into. It's kind of like a temp branch. It, yeah, it's kind of like a temp branch, but you can have multiples of them. You can have a whole bunch of them, and then you can apply them. It's like commits that haven't been applied to the branch. Right. Uh, so now we're on broken. We can do git status. Nothing to commit because we did already make the changes to this. So we can do git stash apply. And when we try to apply those changes, it lets us know, hey, this is going to cause a conflict. It's just another warning. You, you ran into this causing a problem. But we can do. See, get check out uh, master. Can you have it throw the diff into something like meld so you can resolve it? You, uh, yeah, you probably can. Again, uh, I, I just use, yeah, all command line stuff. So With stashing, you can also give us, when you stash it, you can give it a name too if you want to. Oh, hold on. Get reset head. I'm going to go ahead and get reset head and then unstage that and then get status and then get checkout readme because let's pretend like we don't want those changes anymore. So now we check that file out and it went in and said, okay, all of the changes that we had, we're going to dispose of those and then move back to whatever it was that we were on, git stash apply, oh, git checkout master, git status, what did I do here? It, there's a conflict yep. with applying it. Git reset head, git status, git checkout readme, git status, git checkout master, and then git stash apply. We've now got the uh, modified file here. Git add, git commit dash m, finishing the class, and then git push. And all of these changes and all the things that we've been playing with, for better or for worse, are up on Git Hub. And we can actually see everything that we've worked on. We can see all of the commits that we made. We can see who authored them. All of the, the, all of the information, the metadata that you uh, were talking about earlier, all of that is now available to us. So we can see who changed what, who did it, when. Uh, uh, supposedly, we should have why. Uh, whenever you're making your commit message, your commit message should be detailed and educational and let the next programmer know exactly what's going on and you should leave lots of compliments and you should have like lots of warm and fuzzy feelings whenever you're done reading whatever it is that they put in there. Now whether that's the case or not, I, you know, probably not. Uh, you're probably going to get commit messages that say, I changed something. And then you get to go hunting to see what they changed or what was done. Uh, Again, the ever fun, this is our initial commit. And you can see, as you break through it, exactly what was added. We added to the git ignore file. We added to the readme file. And we added the uh, information to our story right there. So You can get this information out of git status too, I think. Yes, you can. So you can either do it on the command line, 
or you can do it through the web page whenever you're using the web page. So whatever you feel more comfortable with or whatever's faster for you. So you so. don't have control over who makes changes to your... Well, see, you do as far as if you have this, like, like my dot files. I have all my dot files up on GitHub. If one of you were to go in and pull my dot files, make a bunch of changes and put, hey, this guy's stupid, LOL, you're so dumb, hit enter and then try to push that up, uh, it will come up and then they can say, okay, I want to make a pull request and it will ask me essentially, do you want to commit these changes to your repository? And I can check mark no and then they're disposed of. And there will be a history that says this user at X date tried to make this commit and it will have a ton of information about everything that you tried to do and then it will say it was rejected with my reason or accepted. Or if you, on the other hand, if somebody makes really crafty changes to your your dot vimrc or, or whatever, um, you can review them and accept the changes that would improve your your dot file um, if you wanted to. So you have, you're in control in, in terms of what gets accepted, but anybody can suggest anything. So exactly. It's just like being in a room full of people. Anybody can look over your shoulder and say, hey, I think you should do this. But at the end of the day, you're the one behind the keyboard. You make that decision. But the whole idea of putting stuff up on GitHub is so that people can read it, so that people can look at it, make improvements. Uh, really, I've only ever had one snafu with somebody trying to do something ridiculous with my stuff. What if somebody becomes really annoying? Is there any way to ban a particular user from making no, I tried. <laughs> they, <laughs> they put some, some real bad stuff into a commit that they tried to push up to me. And I said no, and then I sent in an email that asked, essentially, this is designed for total 100% audit system. So even though there, there's a section somewhere on this web page where you can go in and look and find out that somebody said something really negative, uh, you can look at that and it's going to be there forever because that's how this works. No, but I mean, if they keep sending annoying things, annoying things, you can't have their account banned or have them... I'm sure maybe you could petition for it, but it's... Yeah, there's got to be something that you can do, but it, there's nothing like front and center, press this button and this person gets put into a jail. I mean, there's just... I haven't seen any well, problems with get. that, though. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, generally you're not going to have a problem. I had I hit one, but uh, other than that, you know, you can having everything open is a pretty good disciplining approach because if somebody's going to be a jerk, um, they get a reputation. Yeah, I mean, yes, somebody could make an account and then make a, a silly commit or something like that. But again, you hit no and you move on. You can close comments. You can also do that. You have a lot of control over uh, commits, things like that. You can close comments. There's moderation. Again, you have a wiki that you can update, make changes to, uh, leave information for other people, things like that. And then if anybody tries to make changes that you don't approve of, you can, you can always say no. You can also add other people as contributors. So if you're working on an open source project, project with a few other people, you can make where they can commit to your repo as well. Yes. And you can create teams also. So if you have a group of guys who sit around and like to work on VimRC files, you guys can make a team of dudes who do nothing but work on VimRC files and track all of your contributions and everything else through that. Make a GitHub page. Sit down and, you know, the VimRC dudes, whatever you want to do. Best MRC ever. Yeah. You, you can block users on GitHub. Oh, you can? Okay, fantastic. So, repositories you control, they can't, they can't make changes or they can't submit. Yeah, so you can, you can make changes to, to block people. Anything else? Have I bored you guys long enough? I can give you a pull request. You can go with that. Looks like. Oh, did you send one to Turbo Octo Learning Cat? I'm doing that now. Great. I'm not sure you mentioned it, but you did say that um, that you could have like a company account or whatever, and then no one else can access that. Correct. Uh, and the company accounts, uh, I think you have a limit on the number of users you can have for free, but there's paid accounts too. And if you want to keep your stuff like a super secret, 
Uh, they have super secret squirrel accounts that you can pay money for in order to hide your code if it was. Also known as industrial <laughs> accounts or business accounts. So yeah. One paid account. accounts. Paid accounts. One thing that is nice about GitHub is the way they do their organizations is that an organization is an account, but it's people who are members of an organization. I'm committing and creating a pull request now. Okay. Which is really nice because there's no password for the organization. There. There it is. Okay, so we got a pull request. Thank you. We can demo this too. With a very descriptive commit name. Mm hmm. Change stuff updates. So he created, he created himself a pull request. He sent it over to me. And let's see. We can look at the commits, and then we can see the files that are changed. And we can see that he added some text that says, this is a story about Git. So right there, side by side, we can see my original file and we can see what he offered to me. We can see that it consisted of a single commit. And then GitHub even kind of takes a look at it for you and lets you know, hey, I think that you can merge this and there's not going to be any conflicts or anything like that. This looks like a very safe commit. So merging can be performed automatically is the way they put it. So you can uh, click. GitHub will also guess at the uh, language. So if it's Java or JavaScript or PHP or Python, it'll uh, identify that. Mm -hmm. So just in case you forgot what your project was language. <laughs> <laughs> you can also add line comments to a specific line of a diff. So if you have a big a big pull request, correct, and it's good, but there's something that needs change. You can go to that specific line and say fix this. I can actually we'll show that. This is super awesome. Hit commit, and now there's actually a comment that he can see. So he can go back and look at that pull request, and he can see that I approved of the con of whatever it was that he did. Or if, again, if you need to make changes or anything like that, it's all about open communication, being able to view uh, what's being done, and keep track of the differences between different files. And all of it's about making sure that all of that information is very, very available at all times. So I really like it. Uh, and again, now we can see that within where we're doing our, uh, our merging, you can actually see my comments in there now. If he were to make a comment, that would show up as well. Other people can make comments. People can discuss the code. All of this can be kept within an area so that you can very quickly monitor what's happening. I'm going to go ahead and merge the pull request. He said he's changing stuff updates. Great. I like it. We're confirming. It has now been merged in. I gave you an issue, too. OK. And then you can go in there, and we can see. I've never really thought of issues as gifts. <laughs> <laughs> and let's take a look at the issues. There is a problem. <laughs> I will not tell you what the problem is. <laughs> That's too descriptive. So you need, to, <laughs> real. you need to plus one that. Right. Great way of, you know, thanks. This is exactly what I have come to expect. <laughs> Comment. Also, no. one other thing with Git is, in general, you shouldn't do development in master. You should make a branch off master. Correct. Develop a feature, then merge it in. This way, you don't get problems with bad code in master. Yes. Thank you for bringing that up. The whole point of using branches is to protect the master branch, which is the trunk. Uh, Master should usually, as far as we are concerned, whenever you're programming with us, master should be known good. If you fall back to master, everything should turn on. There should be no warnings, no, no exclamation points telling you that you have burned down the world, anything like that. You should be able to go back to master and be functional. Uh, is that always the case? No, there can be bugs in master. We all know that. But the idea is generally to keep master as known good as soon as you're ready to start programming, you branch from master. You work on a sliver of code. That code should be one complete object. 
If I'm going to go in there and I'm going to add the ability for a person to make a comment, that's all we're going to do on that branch. That branch is going to be add comments. And then at the end of completion on that, we commit, we push it up, the other person pulls that branch down, reviews it. If it's functional, then we're OK and we merge to master. Uh, and everything idea-wise per commit should be one item. So you don't want to start on a branch, begin creating the ability to make comments, and then decide, oh, in addition to that, I want to be able to give people the ability to add thumbs up, and then come, uh, commit both of those changes within one commit, because you want to be able to roll back from commit safely. Uh, if you have started making a commit, and you find out that it's wrong, or somebody doesn't want it, or they don't like it, you don't want to have to destroy your thumbs up and your commenting just to get rid of uh, one set of commits. That's, that's typically called a clean master. It's gone through unit testing, Jenkins is, and so forth, and it's known good. Um, some projects that are less formal run with something called a dirty master, and that means people are working directly on the master, no guarantee that it works, and um, that's usually for quick and dirty projects that have a limited lifespan. Um, but if you're doing anything serious, a clean master is how that's typically referred to. Also, there's a GUI program for Mac called GitX, which is really nice for managing. If you've made a bunch of changes and you forgot to commit them, you can actually select, I want to commit these lines as one commit, and these lines as something else, which is really nice for that. Yes. You can do that on the command line. You can. Dash P. What, what Linux package was that? For patch. <laughs> Source tree lets you do it. So that's a rough overview of Git and GitLab and Jekyll and command line and dot files and I and yes, Git everything. Just Git it all. So. Is there uh, another program that, that is not uh, in the cloud? This is in the cloud, right? Well, essentially, you have access, like, are you asking if you'd like to self-host? Like, you would want something that maybe you could put on a VPS or something like that? Like, that you would have total control over? Yeah. Uh, there's a, a program called GitLab, which is what we use for our internal uh, system, and it's very similar to GitHub. However, you have complete control over it, so that you can take it, spin it up on a VPS, and then you would be the only one that has access to it. Uh, and the nice thing is, is even though we added origin master, uh, origin up there, whenever I was adding uh, that URL, you can add multiple URLs. So you can have origin, and then you can have remote uh, GitLab, and you can actually push to all of these different URLs depending on what you're doing, and you can manage all of that directly through Git. Uh, Git. So if you have a GitHub account, and then you create your own GitLab, uh, and you host that yourself and you take care of that yourself. If you wanted to do all of your development under GitLab and then only post known good, uh, fully working, fully tested stuff up to GitHub for people to, con to ingest, then you could do so. Uh, you, can, you have total control over what you want to do with your code. Yeah, remotes are not just one reference. It's a list of the remote access to other Git uh, repositories that you have a relationship with. So you can have multiple remote identifiers. And you have the option, depending on whether you're using GitHub, GitLab, or other tools. There's other ones. Those are just the two that we use, so that's what I'm used to. But uh, there's even self-contained like little Ruby executables that essentially work like uh, GitHub. I can't remember off the top of my head the name of it, but it's real popular in China. Um, that allow you to essentially have a remote repository that you can throw up on a server and you know period forward slash and the name of the file and it will create what amounts to a repository that you can push to. So you have hundreds of options when it comes to what you want to do with it. So you're talking only on your machine, it wouldn't be on the If you'd like to only do it on your machine, you could do so. You could even run git lab locally and work you know, the exact same workflow of pushing to GitLab, of doing everything within that program, but it would all be just on your local machine. So yes, that is, that is an option to you if that was something you were interested in. 
I don't need GitHub or GitLab to use GitHub. Correct. You do not. Git, you could use if you're just one person you want to keep track of changes you make to a file. Yes. I think the Ruby script is popular because I think GitHub is blocked by the Chinese firewall. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, I know. They were like fire blasting it or something, trying to can it or something. Okay, yeah, so. It's, a, it's not a good relationship. Uh, Mark's question about running locally. So, one of the things I've, I've used Git for, aside from keeping things in a local repository, um, but I also had some files I needed to share and keep in sync across multiple systems. So, I actually set up a Git repository where I just do check ins and check outs on both sides. Um, it was a place where using rsync and, and unison weren't going to work for a variety of reasons. Uh, and that worked fine. I set up an SSH key. It's only allowed to use Git, so I don't even have to worry about a compromise uh, through the boxes. Um, and then also, uh, it, as far as that goes, that was it was over configuration files that were outside of Etsy. Uh, but there's a tool called Etsy Keeper, which will allow you to keep all of your configuration stuff in Etsy in uh, con uh, configuration management. Uh, Git is one of the options for that. Uh, it's a great tool, and it understands there are certain things that shouldn't be backed up, uh, and it keeps those outside of Git. Uh, and then uh, for sysadmins, the bane of, of us for all configuration management tools or, or uh, concurrency management tools is that they don't track permissions and timestamps on files, uh, or, they, or they do a horrid job if they even try. Um, so Etsy Keeper has a wrapper that'll keep track of all of those for you. Uh, because if you put configuration files back with the wrong ownership, Things go borky fast. <laughs> that would be another good question about Git and how it handles permissions and stuff. I know that in Subversion you had to put those in the comments, I think. Um, as far as we're concerned, when we're working on stuff, uh, everything that we have committed up to GitLab, uh, we essentially, you know, I'm, I'm owner of the file and uh, commit it and add add my messages, no, I think et cetera, et cetera. referring to configuration files in Etsy that, you know. Need, oh, like the dot files? Yeah, or they need to be owned by root or, right. you know, if you've got um, Apache, um, you've got uh, SE Linux uh, uh, context uh, that needs to be set for um, if you're going to be serving files outside of root. Yeah, so, so Git's thing Stuff like that. that is that should all be handled through deployment scripts. Uh, the one thing that Git does is it will strip um, execute. I believe it strips the execute permission, so you don't accidentally deploy something as an exploit. Um, but if you want to make sure there's certain ownership, have SE Linux or uh, uh, App Armor or anything else, uh, then you've got to do that in your deployment script. So what we do to get around that is we use Vagrant files. Uh, and we use something called Vagrant. So I, even though I'm on a Mac, I'm actually developing inside of Ubuntu uh, whenever I'm doing all of my development at work. And the Vagrant box config file is actually created and designed to go in and say, OK, from GitLab, I'm going to use this SSH key. I'm going to pull down each one of these repositories. I'm going to put them into their very special folder. I'm going to change all of the permissions to exactly what it needs to be. So all of that is handled through Vagrant for us. Uh, doing it by hand or doing it in another method, I don't know, but I, we do all of those, all of that micromanaging of sorts through Vagrant. And the, the whole point of doing that is at the end of the day, if I need to, I can Vagrant destroy, completely get rid of my dev box, Vagrant up, and within 30 minutes I can be up and running with every single tool that we need or, or use uh, immediately off of a known good file. So I can use a brand new operating system essentially every single day if I need to, which I'll, I'll talk to Hans and, and Shamba later. I would like to do a, a course on Vagrant next, just to kind of give you guys an idea of some of the stuff that you can do with that. So if you guys hate me, you guys need to tell me, because I'm just going to keep coming back. Like, literally, you're just going to keep ending up with me. <laughs>